So today's lecture is Dr. Chris McKay. Chris is a planetary scientist with NASA's Ames Research Center. His research focuses on the evolution of the solar system and the origin of life. He's also actively involved in planning for future Mars missions, including human exploration. And Chris is a founding member of the Mars Society. Uh, before the Mars Society started in 1998, Chris was a member of the Mars Underground and participated in all the Case for Mars conferences in the 1980s, where he met a young Robert Zubrin. And so he's been part of our movement uh, since the very, very early days. Welcome, Chris, uh, to the high school program. Thanks, James, and hello, everybody. Uh, very interesting, this summer class. It sounds like a lot of fun. I hope you guys are enjoying it. What, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the topic that brings me to Mars, and that's the question of life. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, and while I'm talking, uh, if you have questions, uh, uh, just uh, you know, use the raise hand or just uh, wave or just start talking. Uh, that way, uh, you know, we can uh, talk about things as we move along. So I'm going to share my uh, a uh, presentation that I put together for you guys. Uh, so that when I do that, my experience with Zoom is it tends to limit my ability to see the rest of the screen. So uh, James, if, the, if there's a question and I'm not getting it, can you uh, interrupt or just let me know and so we can do it because I, okay, here we go. Life on Mars. Uh, and this is the date and here we are and let's go. Uh, I like to split the question of life on Mars into three parts. Uh, past, present, and uh, future. Just a second here. Uh, I'm going to stop my picture because I, you know who, what I look like and it doesn't change in the next hour. And it gives me a better, uh, better uh, reception. Uh, so let's get back to there. Okay. So you guys should see my whole screen. Yep, you're um, looking good. Great. I'm going to try to do one more adjustment here to there. Okay, so now um, three aspects to life uh, that are very important when you think about Mars. Past, did Mars have life? And a very important question that often gets neglected is, was that life a second genesis? I'll explain what I mean by that. Then, of course, there's life present. And this means, of course, astronauts, humans, and our life support systems. Can Mars support life? Is it a place where humans can live and work? I submit that we don't know the answer to any of these questions. We don't know that Mars is a place where humans can live and work. We hope it is. We think it will be, but we have to be, we have to find out by trying. Finally, Mars future, can, does Mars, can Mars have a biological future? Uh, this is the idea of terraforming, something else is interesting to me. So I view Mars through the lens of life in this way, past, present, and future. Um, okay, I'm mostly today going to talk about the first one. Did Mars have life? Was it a second genesis? So let's click here. There we go. So what I call, a I don't call the search for life on Mars, I call it the search for a second genesis of life on Mars. And what do I mean by that? Here in the bottom of this slide, I show what's called the tree of life. This is life as we know it. This is life on Earth. All life on Earth traces back biochemically and genetically to this tree. So as you've often heard said, there is one type of life on Earth. And this is the diagram of that type of life. Uh, and if you've never encountered this before in your biology classes, go into Google and just type the tree of life and check it out. It is, I think, one of the most important icons of modern science and one of the most important concepts uh, of modern science uh, of the last 50 years when this was really elucidated by Carl Wolfs and others, that all life on earth traces back to a common ancestor and uh, shares a common origin and a last common ancestor and uh, shares a bio, biochemical unity and genetic unity. 
Well, if you look carefully, you'll notice that I haven't put viruses on this tree. We don't really know how to put the viruses on the tree, but they share in and benefit from the same genetics and chemistry as the rest of life. So we're looking for something that's not on our tree of life. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for another type of life. We're looking for aliens. When people ask me, what do you do at NASA? I say, I look for aliens. I'm, and I really mean it. I'm looking for organisms, for creatures, doesn't matter how big they are, that are not on our tree of life. Then they're alien. Just because they're from Mars doesn't mean they're alien. In order to be alien, they have to be different from us in the basic fundamental way that they represent a different origin of life. So why do we want to do that? Why do we want to search for a second genesis of life? I give two reasons. First, practical. Imagine if we had two examples of biochemistry, life 2.0. We could learn a lot about biochemistry that we probably don't know now by comparing the two examples. And then there's the philosophical reason is that if we found in our own solar system, another example of life, that, is a, that was a separate origin. That would say that life started twice right here in our little corner of the universe, uh, our solar system, which would say life is common in the universe. By, this is uh, an example of the zero one infinity rule. Again, if you don't know that rule, look it up. The computer scientist people think they invented it, but in fact, Isaac Asimov invented it. This is the rule that says the only numbers that make sense in the universe are zero, one, and infinity, which is a way of saying that things can be absent, zero, or there can be one of them, or there can be lots and lots and lots and lots, essentially infinite of them. Well, we know life is not zero. We know it's at least one. If we could get it to two, then we've essentially jumped that barrier between one and infinity. We know that the universe is full of life by the zero one infinity. There is no, no logical possibility that there's only two examples of life in the universe and they both happen to be in our solar system. So finding another life form, separate origin, life 2.0, I think would be a fundamental point uh, in, in science. So let's go to the next slide. Where are we gonna look in our solar system? Here are my four favorite targets. Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. Mars, I give two stars because there's two places I'm gonna talk about where we could find life on, on Mars. Europa is interesting, but it's hard. It's got a thick ice cover. I don't think it's gonna be a target that we're gonna investigate very well with the kind of technologies we have. Enceladus, very cool gets a star. I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll talk a little bit about Titan because there's a mission on their way. But mostly I'm going to talk about Mars because this is a, a course about Mars. Okay, so let's go to Mars. Why Mars? And why is it the first planet that is interesting always comes up when there's a discussion of, of life? Well, it's the evidence of past liquid water. The evidence that that probably was associated with an atmosphere of CO2 and nitrogen. And importantly, and not often appreciated, Mars is cold and dry, which gives it a very good potential for preserving evidence of life that was might have been there. So it had water, it had an atmosphere, and it's been put in a freezer ever since, which means that we have a good chance of finding the remnants of it. Unlike, say, Venus, even if Venus had a early wet Earth-like period, it's been put in an oven ever since. And so remains of that life are gonna probably be uh, not present. Okay, here's the evidence, the core evidence we have for water on Mars. We see water today. Here's a picture of water frost on the, during the Viking mission. And we see evidence of water in the past in these really interesting channels that are carved by liquid water. And mission after mission now is confirming that there is water on Mars today as frost and ice, and that there was ample liquid water in the past flowing in rivers and, and lakes and maybe even an ocean. Okay, uh, so a picture of early Mars and early Earth, and Earth is, is represented here. Here is Earth, obviously, the famous Apollo image of the whole Earth, the whole disk of Earth. Uh, and here is an artist's conception by everyone's favorite space artist, Michael Carroll, 
um, showing what Mars may have looked like, we think, three and a half billion years ago. Now there's one problem with Michael Carroll's painting. He's left out the ice. Mars, even three and a half billion years ago, when it was at its warmest, would have had a lot of ice. So here on Earth, you can see the Antarctic ice sheet. There's no ice sheets on this picture of Mars. They should be. But why doesn't Mars look like that now? The answer, we think, is that because it's too small. These, this is Mars and Earth at the right scale. Often in the solar system pictures, Mars and Earth are shown as if they were the same size. They're not. Mars is about one-tenth the mass of the Earth. It's considerably smaller than the Earth. As a result of it being smaller, it has no plate tectonics, less gravity, and no magnetic field. And these are the effects that cause it to lose its atmosphere and become cold. The reason Mars is not habitable is not because it's farther from the sun, but because it's smaller than the Earth. Okay, so let's talk about the two places on Mars where we might search for evidence of life. Uh, so let me pause and see if there's any questions. Uh, and if, uh, Jim, do you see any questions? Because I don't see the pictures of the people anymore. Yeah, um, so students, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom or just unmute and ask your question too. Right. I don't okay. see any at the moment. Thanks, James, because I don't, I see only my screen. Um, there may be a way to fix that, but I, I never figured it out. So oh, I'll Brian, rely on you. Brian, do you have a question? You're raising your hand. Brian. Yes, sir. If if life were to be found on Mars, how do you think we as a species would react to that? That's an excellent point. And I I uh, will come back to that because uh, that's a that's a really good hold that thought, hold that question. Okay. Uh, the Phoenix, the polar regions, the ground ground, if you remember the slides, I showed two places on Mars to search for evidence of life. One is ground ice in the polar regions. The other is ancient lakes near the equator. We investigated the ground ice in the polar regions with the Phoenix mission. 2008, it landed. Uh, there it is looking out, looking down underneath the spacecraft, it could see the ground ice as the dirt had been blown away by the engines. And Phoenix dug down and we found below the ground, isometric ground permafrost. This is just like what you'd find in Antarctica. Um, it's no surprise, the polar regions of Mars are cold. Water there is as ice frozen in the ground. Um, and we can we go, we do go uh, to cold places in Antarctica and we find ice on Earth that's similar in the sense that it is permafrost, ice cement ground with no liquid phase, just like at the Phoenix site. My favorite example of this is one of the very highest elevation valleys in Antarctica called University Valley. Uh, and there we find the most Mars-like ground ice on earth and there's life there. Uh, not much, but it's there. So uh, uh, there could be life in ice in the, in the polar regions on Mars and that's a place we wanna search. We're working on a mission design called Icebreaker to do that. Uh, let me see if I can go forward. Okay, the next locations uh, for searching for life on Mars is ancient lake beds. And a good example for that is Perseverance, which just landed on Mars in 2021, following up on the successful, very successful Curiosity mission, which landed on Mars 10 years ago, next month, and is uh, celebrating its 10 year anniversary, also at an ancient lake bed. Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater. Here's a, a artist's conception of Jezero Crater as it looked three and a half billion years ago. The crater is 50 kilometers wide. It would have been filled with water. And the red X is where Perseverance landed. So if Perseverance had gotten there earlier, say three and a half billion years earlier, it would have needed to be a submarine rather than a lander, rather than a rover. Uh, but we were a little bit late. And so the water's all gone. But this picture is also wrong in the same sense that Michael Carroll's picture is wrong in that it needed to have ice. So I've just Photoshopped the ice in myself. Jezero Crater, three and a half billion years ago, would have been filled with water, but it would have had a cover of ice on it, a thick cover of ice on it. Um, and 
But underneath that ice, in that water, sediments, this is scenes from these kind of places. There's places on earth that we can go to that are models of this. Here's a, a very good one, a very popular one. The Atacama Desert in Chile, which is a, uh, uh, as you can see, a morphological model for these places on Mars. It is the driest place on earth. It's really quite remarkable that you can take a commercial flight to a little town, a fairly big town called Anafagasto, rent a car, and in an hour and a half, drive to the driest place on Earth, the most Mars-like place on Earth in terms of water availability. Uh, it's incredible. Then there's the Antarctic dry valleys, which are the coldest dry place on Earth. They're not as dry as the Atacama, but they're cold, they're frozen. So in that sense, they're an important analog for Mars, like University Valley I showed you earlier. Now I wanna focus on uh, ice covered lakes in the Antarctic as examples of what Gisero Crater may have been like billions of years ago. Um, this is a picture of an ice covered lake in Antarctica and our camp that we set up on that lake on the ice cover. So what you're seeing in this big white expanse is the ice cover on top of a lake. And we set up our tents on that in the summer, 24 hours of sunlight, and uh, to investigate what's going on in that lake. And we did, we, we do, we were about the third or fourth expedition to come to this lake over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, we did what most of them did, which is drill a hole in the ice cover and take samples and put probes in the water. But we also did something that no one had ever done before, which was open up a hole to dive into the lake so that we could see what was going on under the water. Um, this is uh, quite remarkable. And it gave us a perspective that we just never had had before on this lake. And um, what we could see, which became obvious once you went in the water, was that at the bottom of the lake, there is mounds, pyramids, about a half a meter high, made by microorganisms, uh, that microbial mats, and that these are mounds, are analogs for structures that we find on early Earth and possibly would find on Mars. These are literally pyramids built by bacteria. Uh, they take the ones in this lake in Antarctica, we think take about 10,000 years to build, uh, but uh, they're the lakes are stable and undisturbed. There's no organisms in the lake that will eat these bacteria. And so they can, uh, they can grow peacefully. We, we are the first humans that we were the first humans to go into this lake. And in fact, we were the first vertebrates to go into this lake. This is an isolated lake. There's nothing but microorganisms in this lake. And this lake represents to me the best model we have on Earth of what Jezero Crater might have been like, optimistically, three and a half billion years ago when it was an ice covered lake on Mars. Here is ice covered lake in Antarctica. Jezero Crater was an ice covered lake on Mars. In Antarctica, the ice cover is an important part of protecting the lake from the cold environment. The ice cover acts like a blanket. It thermally insulates the lake. It sounds counter counterintuitive, but it's true. The ice cover restricts the flow of heat from the warm water in the lake to the cold atmosphere above it. And if you're interested in that, you can search our papers on this topic where we worked out the physics of it. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, and we know that in Jezero Crater, there are layered deposits. Here's a picture of a mesa that we see from the rover. And these layers, these layers are almost certainly lake deposits set down when Jezero Crater was a lake through billions of years ago, an ice covered lake. And so that optimistically, we might imagine that in those deposits are trapped the remains of life forms like this. That's what we're hoping to find. That's why searching in lake beds, ancient equatorial lake beds is another plausible and interesting place to search for life on Mars. So the, the two targets 
that we are advocating are ground ice in the polar regions and ancient sediments of lake deposits in the equatorial regions. Okay, I wanna move a little bit to try to complete the story here. I know the course is about Mars, but uh, Mars, the search for life on Mars was the start and has now expanded to Titan and Enceladus as possible targets. And you guys, being in high school, will grow up and see expeditions, missions to Mars searching for life, but you will also see missions to Titan and Enceladus, I predict. Well, I, I'm sure because Titan, the missions are already approved. So I'll give you some more uh, background on those to place more context in what are we doing in the solar system. So this is Saturn, Saturn and its moons. And you can see the rings, of course. Uh, Titan is not in this picture because it's so far away. But I want to draw your attention to Enceladus right here in the E-ring. Um, and is one of the most interesting and active moons in the solar system. Cassini in 2006 discovered jets of water coming out of Enceladus. Um, it wasn't completely unexpected because the E-ring, this diffuse ring co-orbitable with Enceladus is not stable. And so the expectation was that there must be a source and the expectation was that that source was some sort of venting on Enceladus, but we were not prepared for the spectacular geysers that were discovered. A flow of water equal to Old Faithful geyser in Yellowstone uh, Park, just, just amazing. And not only is it water coming out of the ocean there, but Cassini was able to fly through the plumes, analyze their chemistry and infer the properties of the ocean and could show that it was plumes derived from a slightly salty ocean in contact with hot rocky core material. Uh, a real incubator for life, quite, quite remarkable. And in the plume, there's organic material. It's not just water, it's soup. Organics, uh, energy sources, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, uh, everything microorganisms need. Uh, quite remarkable. Here it is coming out in space, uh, free samples. Uh, I love free samples. So the, the, uh, there are currently, there is currently not a mission approved to go back to Enceladus, but there are several concepts being worked. The Decadal Survey just recommended Enceladus as a key target. So probably within the next 20 years, there will be a mission that will fly through the plume, through this plume, take a sample and search directly for evidence of life. Now on Titan, Titan, uh, there is there is an approved and a mission has been selected. It's being built. It will launch in five years. It's being built now. It's an eight blade drone mission. And it will investigate Titan. It'll land, do analysis, then fly, charge up its batteries, fly again. And it'll continue doing that for years. And part of its science objectives, part of its science objectives are to search for evidence of life on the surface. And not just to search for evidence of life, but to search for evidence of life that could survive in liquid methane, which is the liquid that we see on the surface of Titan. Titan has liquid, it has beaches, it has a large seas, it has clouds, it has rain, but it's not water, it's liquid methane. So how would you search for life that lives in liquid methane, not water? Obviously you would not look for DNA and you would not look for amino acids, but what you could do is you could look for hydrogen variations because the chemical theory suggests that if there's life on Titan, it is consuming hydrogen. And it is the only thing on near the surface that will be consuming hydrogen. So this drone will have a hydrogen detector on it to monitor hydrogen just for the purposes of seeing if there is a telltale trace of life 
that might be living in the liquid methane. So, I, so this mission will reach Titan in 2034. So that's 20 years from now. So uh, I'll be long gone. I'll be pushing up uh, daisies. Well, actually, I'll be pushing up poppies since I'm in California. But uh, 20 years from now, you guys will be mid-career. So this data will come back while you are uh, still actively involved. And, and that's the thing uh, with missions to the outer solar system. Currently, they take 10, 15 years. So they, the generation that starts the mission isn't usually the generation that finishes it. I benefited from Cassini. Cassini was started when I was not even involved in the space program. But by the time I got to NASA, it was, it was on its way. And I spent uh, 20 years working with Cassini data and uh, analysis. I wanna show you what, uh, what that's gonna look like. This is a artist conception, of course, of the landing on Dragonfly on Titan. It comes in on a parachute and then it deploys from, from, the, from entry and flies to the ground. It flies to the ground directly and sits on the ground, recharges its battery and then flies somewhere else. So here you see it flying for the first time, landing. So this is not land with rockets. It does not land with parachutes. It lands under its own powered control. That will be a first. Then it pops up its antenna, talks to earth, does its work. And then when it's charged up its batteries, flies off and goes somewhere else and repeats. And then it repeats and repeats and repeats. And since it's powered by a nuclear radioactive nuclear uh, isotope generator, it could repeat for, for 10 years. There's no reason why it shouldn't. Okay. Uh, now I want to get to the question that's sort of uh, uh, applied chemistry here. Suppose we do find something on Mars, Europa, Enceladus, or Titan, organic material, gooey, brown, gooey stuff. How do we tell if it was alive? If it's probably dead, but the question is, was it ever alive? Um, and if it's like us, well, you know, we could look for DNA. And that's cool, but that's not as interesting as finding a second genesis. So if it's alien, then it's very hard. So how do we generalize the question or our approach here? First, it's important to note that not all organic material is biological. Uh, you can make organic material in the lab. That's this picture here with the Tholen experiments. That's in fact a uh, project, a science project done by a high school student in my lab some years ago, where you simulate Titan, hook it up to a spark system, test the coils, and flow nitrogen and methane through, and you can make brown organic material. It's got nothing to do with biology. We also find organic material, including amino acids and meteorites, like this piece of the Tagish Lake meteorite, no evidence of biology. But up here in the corner, little plants and dirt, there's organic material, and it is evidence of biology. So how do you tell the difference? If you had organic material, how do you tell whether it's meteoritic, uh, artificially made by lightning or something, or biology? And there is a characteristic signature of biological organic material. And that is the most obvious one, the most interesting one, is that biological organic material uses L-amino acids, the left-handed amino acids in proteins and not the D amino acids and proteins. So amino acids come in left and right-handed forms, but your body has a lots of amino acids making up lots of proteins, but it only uses the left-handed ones in the proteins. So there is a signature, a left-handed signature in the proteins in your body and the amino acids in your body in all life on earth that is not present in meteorites or organic material made in the lab. And so we can look for that pattern and we can generalize that concept to say that life has a pattern that non-life doesn't have. And we can recognize our life by that pattern and we might find life, we might find a pattern on Mars or somewhere else 
that's not like exactly like us, but it's a similar pattern, say different amino acids, or right-handed instead of left-handed, right? And that's what I draw by the alien in red here. So you have a non-biological distribution, which is, has no pattern. Then you might have a pattern that could be the biological distribution that we have, but then you might have life with a pattern that's different than the pattern we have. We could call that alien life. And then I added Titan, which life that is so strange, it's not even close to what we've got. It, it, it can't be the same. So the alien life might be say life with different amino acid or right-handed instead of left-handed amino acids. But Titan life won't even have amino acids. It doesn't have water. It's got to have a fundamentally different chemistry. So it'll have patterns, but they will be totally uh, unrecognizable. There won't even be a meaningful comparison to the pattern that we see in our biology. So it's very interesting to think of life as a chemical pattern and to search for that pattern and understand that pattern. And the, the advantage of searching for life that way is you don't have to grow it. You don't have to figure out how to make it grow or which is what Viking tried to do or, and for something like Titan, it's very hard to figure out how to make it grow. So uh, the, the approach that we're taking to search for life now is to look for these patterns in the amino acids and the lipids of which life is constructed. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to the question that someone asked earlier. What will you do if you find evidence of a second genesis of life on Mars? Now, I think this is an important question and it's never discussed. People talk about, well, let's go search for life. Well, but then they say, well, what are you gonna do? What happens if you find it? And it, I think it's like the dog chasing the car. You, know, you could ask the dog, well, what are you gonna do if you catch the car, <laughs> right? You're unprepared for success. We are unprepared for success. We do not really know what we're gonna do if we go to Mars, find evidence of life, and we find that that evidence indicates a separate second genesis of life on Mars. What does that mean? What are we gonna do? And are we, are we prepared for that answer? Um, the answer might be no, in which case preparation wasn't necessary, but the answer might be yes. And yes is a much more interesting answer. But in any case, we need to be prepared for that answer because I think the implications are pretty profound both scientifically and ethically. And it opens up the question of the moral status of microbes. Uh, and I'll just go bound down to the bottom statement here. Microscopic organisms which score low moral status on earth because moral status is based on things like pain, complex behavior, communication, so on, would have high moral status if they were the sole representative of a different type of life on another planet. So suddenly we'd be talking about the rights of microbes, right? Which we don't do on earth. You know, nobody worries that you brush your teeth and kill thousands of microbes at the time, every time you do it, right? Nobody cares and that's fine. Continue to brush your teeth and do those heinous acts. But if those microbes on Mars were the only example of another type of life, second genesis of life, distinct example of life separate from our life, that has, I think, important implications. Um, so what do we do about it? My suggestion is we need to make sure that everything we do on Mars is reversible. Now, people often say, well, if there might be life on Mars, then we should not go, which is kind of silly, or we should be sterile, make sure that all of our spacecraft are sterile. And if we send humans, sterilize their equipment and the, that's impossible. You cannot do exploration of Mars with sterile methods. And it's not only is it impossible, it's, it's, it's needless. When, I, when we go to Antarctica to search for evidence of life in the exotic places, we don't sterilize our equipment. We can analyze samples carefully using what's called aseptic technique. We don't need to sterilize the graduate students to go do the work. Uh, but we're very careful that we don't do anything irreversible in the environment. Now, for example, in those lakes in Antarctica that we study and dive into, introducing microorganisms from our body in the lake is not irreversible. The microorganisms are just going to die because the pH in that water is 10. 
and it's zero degrees centigrade and there's nothing that lives on my body that likes pH 10 and zero degrees, but we could make an irreversible change in that ecosystem if we dumped a lot of organic material in it because those lakes are ultra oligotrophic. So we are careful to bag and bucket out all of our waste and all of our drinking water, all of our food water, everything that we have with us that's organic, we carry out. We leave nothing in the environment. You may have noticed the cans in the foreground, the barrels, that was our urine and solid waste collection items. Everything, all of our water, everything. We leave nothing in the environment uh, because the organic input, not the biological input, the organic input would overwhelm the lake. Uh, so the point here is what's realistic is not to be, to not go to Mars because there might be life there, not to sterilize human bases or rovers and whatnot, because we can't do that, but to be careful that we can decontaminate anything we contaminate if we've discovered that there's life there. Uh, and of a human base, this is Carter's uh, uh, wonderful uh, art, artwork of a human base. This could be made reversible microbes will be released into the environment, but it will not be irreversible. Uh, it can be made reversible. I want to end with this slide. I don't want to talk a lot about the future. I'm mostly talking about searching for life on missions now, but the future will come uh, and we'll have to make choices based on our understanding of the past and the present and what we value. So the question of the future of Mars is best illustrated by water. We have good evidence that early in its history, Mars had water. We think we understand why it became the desert world we see today, and we'd like to know if there was life on it when it had water. But then there's the question of the future. Could we restore Mars to habitable conditions, warm it back up, bring the water back, melt the ice, create conditions suitable for life? Uh, that's a, a, a whole different topic and uh, one worth looking into. Last, the uh, previous Mars Society virtual conference, I gave a talk about terraforming uh, and that's online and I, I, you can find it where I summarize where, where our current understanding of this is in terms of can we do it and should we do it? Uh, so let me leave it like that. I'm gonna uh, now thank you for your attention and ask if there's any questions and uh, stop sharing so I can see other people. Great. Brian, question. Yes, sir. So similar to how they discovered grass in Antarctica a couple years back, would you use that same method of digging in the polar ice caps on Mars to discover life? Uh, well, I'm not, we, we uh, the, the short answer is yes. The methods that we use in Antarctica for drilling and taking samples. Uh, people in our work in University Valley, we use a drill. There we're drilling into dry ground and ice cemented ground. Uh, but we also have developed drills for drilling through ice covered lakes. So drilling through the ice, thick ice, and also in glaciers, people. So there's separate technologies for each of those. Roughly all of them, they're drilling, but they're, the details are different. And all of those could be used on Mars as well. One thing that's in, of course, uh, we find on Earth is that drilling is a lot easier when you've got people there with hands. It's not the brains or it's not the eyes and it's not the feet that are useful. It's the hands. The ability to manipulate things with hands is what people bring. And that allows drilling to go much, much better. So I, I think drilling deeply is one of those science goals that's going to be greatly enabled by the presence of uh, humans. Uh, human exploration uh, on Mars. We have a couple questions on. Okay, so first one's from Michael Frank, and you showed on one of your first slides this sort of tree of life, the simplified tree of life. He's asking, are viruses not on the tree of life because we can't define if they are alive or not? Well, the, the reason they're not on the tree of life is because the, what's used to map out that tree of life, that particular version I saw is ribosomal RNA and viruses don't have ribosomes. So it's because viruses are uh, 
I guess you could call them simplified degenerate life forms. They don't carry all the equipment that a cell needs to, to grow and reproduce. And it's the genetics of that equipment that is used to map out the tree. You might be able to construct a tree uh, based on some of the things that viruses do have, like RNA sequences and DNA sequences directly, uh, and then map them on the tree of life. There, there's a big debate. I, I acknowledge what you said about there's even a debate about whether viruses should be considered alive or not. My view on that is viruses are a part of a system that we call life on earth. Uh, they are pretty uh, uh, curious, uh, but prevalent part of that system, but they're clearly part of that system. They can't exist separate from it. Uh, they, uh, and they have clear evidence of their link to it in terms of RNA and DNA. Uh, viruses, I think is an easy case. The much harder one is prions. Uh, are they alive? Are they, I mean, how do they fit into the story? Uh, but that's a that's a whole different question. Um, let's see one more question. Uh, actually, we have two more. So Shreya is asking: Would future astronauts train uh, on Mars-like terrain by going to destinations like Antarctica and the Atacama Desert? I heard that the Apollo astronauts trained for the moon at Meteor Crater, Arizona. Yes, the answer to that question is yes. Astronauts will train going to the moon for in terms of moon or Mars by going to the Arctic. A Mars Society has got uh, a base that's set up just to do that and has had a crew some years ago uh, that spent uh, almost, what is it, four months, Jim and little James up there, uh, training on that. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, that, that, that's very, I think it's, it's a very important, uh, the, the polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic are very important resources for getting ready to go to Mars. Not just scientifically, uh, not just in terms of equipment like drills, as we've talked about, but also in terms of people uh, getting ready for the, for the rigors and the training and the teamwork required. So yeah, if you wanna go to Mars, uh, think about, uh, spending time in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And, and I'll just remind you that uh, there are a lot of programs for Antarctic research. Different countries have different programs. Uh, many, many countries have programs in Antarctica. Virtually all of those programs have graduate students that work on research projects. So uh, if you're keen to get involved in Antarctic research, uh, check it out, check it out. For those of you who are in the US, the programs are through the National Science Foundation. Go to their website. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's quite an experience. I recommend it strongly. I've been going to Antarctica since uh, I was a graduate student. Uh, my first year was 1980. So it's been a long time. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Excellent. Um, Sian McNish is asking, would the ethical concerns be different if we found evidence of past life on Mars as opposed to present life on Mars? Well, that, that's a good question. And it, if, we, if we found evidence of past life and no evidence of life continuing to today and no way to reconstruct that past life, then I, I think it does, it is very different because then, it, then of course, it's dead. So the the obligations, ecological and moral obligations to dead things is very different than to living things. So I, I would say, yes, I'm hoping that we'll find life that's active on Mars, of course. Uh, if we find ancient life and it's frozen in the ground, say in the polar regions, even if it's dead, we might be able to uh, reconstruct it as people now talk about reconstructing mammoths and things like that. So, uh, I would really hope we, we see the day where there is Martian life and it's a second genesis and that would be very cool and interesting and it would challenge our ethics, but it would inform our science. Excellent. Uh, any other questions, students? Feel free to unmute and ask. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, I remember hearing quite a while back that there was this theory that life originated on Mars and then came to Earth here. Uh, if expanding on the question that CN asked, if 
there was evidence of past life that we originated from, how do you think that would affect everything? Yeah, that's a good point, Brian. There is discussion that Earth and Mars may not be biologically isolated. And so if there was life on Mars, it may have come from Earth and vice versa. Life from Mars, uh, you know, Earth to Mars, Mars to Earth. We know that there's rocks that came from Mars that have landed on Earth. We know that they could have carried life. So it may be that Mars had life and it was not a second genesis, not any more than, say, Antarctica is a second genesis because they're not isolated. That would be disappointing to me to find that Earth and Mars are really just one coupled ecosystem because uh, I really want to find, I really want to get N to two. Uh, and if we find that Earth and Mars are coupled, we're still at N equals one. It's interesting. It's science. It's fun. But it's not N equals two. And the question that drives me is the search for getting N to two. Because uh, that tells us something about the universe. Anish is asking, if people find life on Mars, how would they bring it back to Earth? Would they send the rovers to pick it up until we go to Mars? Well, that's a good question. And we don't know the answer to that yet. I think the answer has to be very, very carefully. Uh, because, uh, you know, as we know, and we're learning more and more, we got to worry about uh, contamination and pandemics. and you can't risk the Earth's biosphere just for a science experiment. So you, you've got to, that doesn't mean you have to stop and say, well, I, I'm, I'm frozen by fear and inaction. I don't do anything because uh, that's a, in a way just as dangerous. Uh, so you have to be, but, but you have to be very, very careful. Um, and and uh, what that means exactly, I don't know yet. We have to work it through as we find out more about Mars and about the life that's there and so on. Excellent. Um, any other questions? I will ask a quick one unless there's any other ones. So, um, so, so Dr. McKay, the students um, during this program are being tasked with designing a, a Mars landing mission. So we're going to give them transportation. Uh, they can land 30 metric tons on Mars, but they have to design what that is, like what, how, you know, how many crew members, what are the crew members' skill sets, what, is the, what are the exploration systems they bring with them. Any advice you have for them on, as they undertake that type of design exercise? Well, uh, I guess uh, it's a good question. I, I would, uh, I guess the advice I would give is imagine that you're, uh, that you're out in the, in the wilderness and what you need to survive. Uh, if you only bring scientists and science equipment, uh, and not, for example, the ability to repair, you know, mechanical engineering and you know, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so practical aspects must not be ignored. Yeah, that's a great point. And we've had other lectures that have talked about protecting from radiation, um, how to land on Mars. And so yeah, they're kind of getting that, uh, a lot of the pieces of the puzzle with these lectures. Is there any other, are there any other questions, students? Otherwise, I think, uh, oh, Brian, you have one more? Go ahead. On the topic of making the mission, could we send stuff to Mars in advance of the mission? Yes, yes. that is. Yeah, obviously, yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that is an option, Brian. Like one of the things we mentioned when Dr. Zibrin was going over this is like, you're going to have the Earth return vehicle for your crew already there. So you don't have to worry about that, for example. Yeah, and we'll have- What about, what about extra equipment such as uh, necessities to repair said vehicles? Yeah, I think we're going to put out the exact criteria, uh, hopefully Monday, but I think I, we do have to stay under 30 metric tons total for the mission, um, not including the Earth return vehicle, but I think you could pre-position some of the science equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all good luck, and uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see what you come up with. Thank you so much, Dr. McKay. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us this morning. Uh, we really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day.